I know, I know. I left the last video on a bit of a cliffhanger. What with mentioning the initial prototype here had several problems uh, big enough to almost scrap the project, but let's ignore that for now. Instead, let's talk about the electronics and key sensors. As I mentioned in the video about piano actions, there are commonly two ways to sense that a note has been played on the keyboard, such that the velocity of the key is also recorded. The first is to use something like these over here, uh, optical slot sensors that are triggered consecutively. And the second is to use a variable sensor like this magnetic Hall effect sensor. Uh, what, too small you say? Uh, here, let me uh, zoom in for you. Uh, this should be better. As I was saying, the first way is to use two or more on-off sensors that are triggered consecutively as the key is nearing its uh, fully pressed state. Let's use this example with the optical slot sensors. They have an infrared emitter on one side and a phototransistor on the other. So if something such as this uh, paper flag gets between the two, then they're considered as closed. Otherwise, they're considered as open. If we have two of them like this uh, right next to each other and insert the flag from one side to the other, the sensors trigger consecutively with the left one triggering first followed by the right one. Based on the timing of these two and the distance between the two sensors, we can calculate the speed at which the flag was traveling. This is pretty much what you have in the vast majority of uh, digital pianos, be they cheap synth action keyboards or hybrid grand pianos. In some cases, more than two sensors are used, but that's mainly just for preventing false triggers during uh, quick repetitions. Uh, the second method is to use something similar to a uh, magnetic sensor or basically any other analog sensor such as, for example, in here, this uh, Hall effect magnetic sensor. It works uh, by measuring the magnetic field uh, passing through it, effectively producing uh, data or, you know, voltage uh, based on how far or how close the magnet is to it. So if we attach a uh, magnet to the key and place the sensor uh, on the frame, then as the key is uh, pressed, the magnet will come towards the sensor, thus triggering it. In this particular case, I'm just moving the magnet close to the sensor, and you can see from the LED right here that it just slowly starts to turn on and uh, is turned on, uh, you know, is brighter the closer the magnet is to the sensor. Uh, properly calibrated, this means that when the key is at the very end of its downward movement, a key press event can be triggered, and the distance measurements from the last couple uh, milliseconds or microseconds of the sensor can be used to calculate the speed at which the key was moving. And so when the time came to pick between the optical sensors and the magnetic sensor for my DIY piano, I said yes. I'm going to use the optical sensors uh, two per key around here to measure the movement of the actual hammer right before it hits the hammer hit felt, while simultaneously attaching a magnet to the key lever action here and measuring its movement with a magnetic sensor. Why would I make it needlessly complicated like that? Well, there's several reasons. By measuring the hammer's velocity with the optical sensors here, I could get the best result in terms of how loud the note should be played, as the velocity of the hammer right before hitting the hammer hit felt would directly correspond to the force with which it hits the theoretical strings. Measuring the hits this way, however, prevents me from measuring when the key is released, which is important, as it is when the key is released and passes the halfway point that the dampeners on an acoustic piano fall on the string and quiet the sound. A regular digital piano measures key movement, not hammer movement, thus allowing both key hits and key release events to be measured with a single set of sensors. But since I wanted to record the hammer movement, I couldn't do that. So to measure a key movement, I decided to add the magnetic sensors to record the actual position of the key, which will allow me to not just uh, time the key release events properly, but also send MIDI 
MIDI data about the real-time positions of the keys, something that uh, does change the sound in an acoustic piano, such as a slow release causing the notes to quiet gradually when compared to a fast release. Though at the moment, um, that's not a function that's actually used by any piano VSTs. Oh well, <laughs> let's consider it as a uh, future-proofing feature. Now let's focus on the optical sensors since there is one more detail that I didn't mention. Here in CAD we see a side view of the two sensors on the right, or more importantly the half millimeter gaps where the sensors check for anything blocking the light's path. And the plastic flag composed of two parts, the three millimeter top section followed by a two millimeter gap and an 8 millimeter bottom section. And this flag design is a bit more complicated than the single solid flag and the reasoning behind it is to decrease the measurement distance from the 4 millimeters between the sensors to the 2 millimeters that I needed. Now let me explain. The bottom sensor here is connected to a timer. Essentially when it switches states, so from open to closed or vice versa, the microcontroller records the exact time down to a fraction of a microsecond as either T on or T off, depending on if it's switched to open or closed. It's also said to inform the microcontroller when it switches from open to closed, but not the other way around. The top sensor, however, is left as a generic input. So when it triggers, the microcontroller doesn't do anything specific. Now let's go over the events that happen in a fraction of a millisecond when the flag goes between the sensors step by step. One, the top part of the flag enters the bottom sensor. The specific timing is recorded as T on and the microcontroller checks the top sensor since it's open, nothing happens. Number two, the top part of the flag leaves the bottom sensor. The specific timing is recorded as T off. Three, the top part of the flag enters the top sensor, but as I said before, this doesn't trigger anything. However, do keep in mind that it is now closed. And finally, four, the bottom part of the flag enters the bottom sensor. The specific timing is recorded as T on, and when the microcontroller checks the top sensor, it notices that it is now closed. This means that a key hit has finally occurred, so the velocity of the flag can be calculated based on the time difference between T on and uh, T off, and the distance traveled, which is this gap of uh, 2 millimeters and not the 4 millimeters, that is the distance between the two sensors. And this means that if I narrow this two millimeter gap, I can get an even tighter measurement. Though in practice, I found that the two millimeters is a good enough distance. One last thing to note is that this process also prevents any uh, false triggers. The only case where a hit is registered is in this very specific situation where the bottom sensor uh, closes when the top sensor is already closed. The flag would need to be raised up by the entire 8 millimeters of the bottom sensor before dropping back down in order for such an event to occur again in a location where it's not meant to. And at this point, the hammer would uh, have long since hit its limit, so this is physically impossible. Let's move on to the actual PCB design. I worked in Easy EDA to plan out the schematic as well as to lay out the board. Uh, mainly due to its ability to order the manufacturing directly from the app. Uh, it worked fine, would have been nice to have some features such as a signal reflection simulation for planning out the high-speed communication between the boards, but for a free product it did what it was supposed to. Mind you, my project wasn't exactly all too complicated, Outside of sensors, LEDs, and uh, the microcontroller, the most complicated part was the aforementioned uh, communication between the boards. And so, uh, going over the design. Right at the top, we have 16 optical sensors, two for each key, which are powered by this 5-volt line. The same line also provides power to the LED strip above. I figured that since I was already designing the electronics, why not include a built-in LED strip that I can light up when the keys are pressed. Uh, going down, we have eight debug LEDs that were helpful in testing the boards and debugging the firmware. 
the mic contro controller along with its communication repeaters and finally the eight magnetic sensors at the bottom uh, on their own separate board with some basic filters that'll measure the actual position of the key. And the boards are designed to be linked in series with one another with each microcontroller acting as the master for the board to its right and as a slave for the board to its left essentially receiving commands from the left and echoing them to the right while also receiving key press data from the right and passing them on along with its own data to the left when asked for. Uh, since the leftmost board will essentially be connected to the on-off buttons, uh, pedals, and the MIDI interface, this allows it to control all the sensor boards in series, regardless of how many boards there are connected together. Uh, be it to request key press data, run calibration sequences, or set the LED lights based on external requests, such as using them for a metronome, you know, just something I planned on for later. Now, just to be clear, I did play around with the idea of multiplexing the sensors such that I only needed a single microcontroller for the entire piano, essentially connecting them together in groups of 16 sensors that get read uh, sequentially, and thus only needing 16 I.O. lines with uh, four selection lines, plus I guess uh, eight analog lines for the magnetic sensors. But I decided against it due to a couple of reasons. Number one, the price of the microcontroller that I went with, an STM32F103 RCT6, uh, came out to be around a dollar per chip or $15 in total, almost half the price of an Arduino controller that I first played around with for testing, and barely a blip on the radar compared to the price of the optical and magnetic sensors, which together cost around $80 in the 11 uh, sensor board set. Number two, using a dedicated microcontroller for a set of eight keys meant I didn't need to worry about multiplexing, which simplified the firmware programming as I could dedicate an I.O. port for each sensor or LED. And finally, number three. Well, I actually don't have a number three. Anyway, transition. So after triple and quadruple checking the design, I set up an order and a month later had a set of 25 boards of which only one had soldering problems, minor ones too, so I managed to get even that board in working order. Uh, why 25? Well, uh, going from 11 boards to 25 only increased the price by around 50%, so I figured I might as well order enough for two pianos on the off chance that I might want to assemble an extra one at some point. Hilariously enough, ordering the boards manufactured with the parts already soldered on uh, turned out to be cheaper than sourcing the parts myself, so I didn't even have to learn to solder the SMD components like the microprocessor here. Or at least that was the plan, since uh, this was my first board design, so I miscalculated the resistors here for optical sensors and needed to replace them, all 400 of them. On the bright side, I am now quite good at soldering SMD components. Oh well. Let's finish off this episode by checking out the assembled backplate. Now, uh, here we have the main board in the center here. It's situated at a bit of an angle due to the path of the hammer as it uh, flies in. Uh, it has a back uh, cover right here that's black to uh, cover it, both as a uh, just-in-case shielding and so that when you look at it from on top through the uh, look window, it should look nicer. In the top section, above the hammer head felt, we have the LED strip behind its uh, diffuser. And at the bottom, we have the magnetic sensors. I decided to attach the magnets to the back rotor along with the uh, back check as I got better readings by gliding the magnet uh, past the sensor rather than have the magnet move in and out. There's a bit of interference from nearby uh, magnets when you have all eight of them, or I guess 88 of them in a row, but the interference is below 5%, so I didn't even have to uh, do any pre-processing for them. And that's all I have to say about the sensor electronics. Next video, I'll talk about the problems with the initial design and cover the next and final prototype that I ended up with after fixing everything. Thank you for listening and until next time. Bye.